coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. It finds you when you think you're safe. It finds you there in the dark, paralyzed with terror by its foul and vacant visage. It leans in close, breathing you in. It comes tonight for you, and it has come to feed. Dressed in shadow and sinister desire, the entity that has come to be called the Hat Man is the supreme denizen of nocturnal dread. What dark dimensions does it walk? What patterns trace its pathway across cultures and across time? On this episode of Belief Hole, we dissect the paranormal parasites and share horrifying encounters with the master of the dark. So light a candle and follow us into the shadow. Synchronicity, Sasquatch, Homunculus, Alien Races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Like, Close the door, in. Jury! In. Close your door! What's the uh, Inner Earth Disagreements? Ghost Dad! <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Feldman. Magicians are Demons, Specters, and Spirit spooks. Summonings, Paralysis, Strange Disappearances, Sky Whale Phenomena, yes. Alternative History, Shadow People. Shh, quiet, I'm trying to say words. It's in the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. Oh, that's cool. And Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Vampire. Hello, hello. We are here. Well, hello, hello. <laughs> well, hello, hello. Good singing entry, John. Thank you. Very melodic. Welcome in. Just how the hat man would like it. It's good to be here. I'm John. I'm Jeremy. And I'm Chris. And we are the Brothers Brothers of the the Belief Hole. Hole. Here to entertain and fascinate. And terrify today. Oh yeah, we got a scary one today. We do. Chris, why don't you introduce us to the concept of the hat man? Well, we've sort of touched on this before. We've we've talked about shadow people many times. Um, Way back from our first season, it was one of those topics that I think we were all really intrigued by. Yes. In the very beginning. Partially due to our personal experiences and partially due to the fact that it wasn't talked about very much. Well, your personal experience. Well, my personal experience. I was trying to include you. <laughs> Don't include me into why, the shadow people. Why did you have a personal experience? With a shadow person? Oh, I thought you meant the hat man. Oh, okay. Well, he is a version. A, some might say. Some might say. A uh, potential leader. He's the king. He might be the king. Maybe He's a dark king. king leader. King leader of the shadow people. I did have a little bit of a hard time going to sleep after I watched that documentary. Oh, yes. Because it plays against, you know, your most basic fears of like shadows at night. Yeah. It's so easy to just see a shadow and be like, Mm -hmm. is that the hat man? Well, I was editing last night and, you know, the more you look at it, we've talked about before, the more the phenomenon can look back at you. And of course that can also get in your mind. Yeah. Where does the line actually drawn from what's in your mind? And, you know, are you actually creating something just by paying attention to it so much? Right. I was working last night researching... And I had my window, my blinds open. It was probably 1 a.m. or something. And the music I had, the ambient music I was playing in the living room had stopped. And I heard like a little clickety-clackety in my yard. We're in a rural kind of area. Like a horse hooves? Not quite horse hooves. Yes, horse hooves in the yard. (laughs) You said clickety-clackety. No, it was a... It's a clicky clack. Anyway, but just for a moment, I was like, okay, I'm reading about the hat man. I'm reading about how, you know, looking into it, you can experience things or whatever. And then, of course, I start to get the feeling like I'm being watched through the window because it's, it's just darkness out there. Yeah. And then in the morning, I took a shower and there was a giant spider in the shower. You think it was outside watching you? <laughs> the spider was outside, like, <laughs> click clacking. Find his way in. I, you know, I had uh, scratches on the closet last night. Remember? That was creepy. Yeah. While researching, you know, that's always the first sign of demonic presence is the scratches in the walls. Probably was a mouse. It's probably the wind moving the closet door. Mice are usually the culprit of scratching. We have a mouse, but he usually stays ground level. You don't know where he goes. So we're going to talk about these things. We're going to talk about the potential reality. And of course, we're going to get to some of the skepticism. But 
we will be talking about the cross-cultural themes, the, th- the patterns that are hard to explain away that relate to the hat man. Of course, when you talk about the hat man, you can't talk about it without talking about shadow people in general. So we're going to talk about that and other paranormal parasites, which is a whole unending, fascinating nebula that branches out into all kinds of different paranormal 140 and phenomena. So we're going to be looking at a lot of different stuff here. Awesome. Um, it is a pretty heavy episode, or there'll be some heavy, dark moments in this for sure, because it is a topic that reaches to the core of your soul, the core of your humanity and your ability to be terrified for whatever purpose. Well, a lot of people, I wanted to say something about this because when we started the show, we, yeah, early on we did the shadow people and there's a thing that happens when you're studying paranormal phenomena a lot, or you're just really into this stuff where you can get a kind of malaise with certain topics. And shadow people is one of them for me. Hatman, Shadow People. And I think the reason is because it is so ubiquitous. There's a real phenomena that's occurring and it's happening at a higher rate, I feel like, than a lot of other paranormal phenomena. So much that people are reporting these stories. You hear it a lot more often. A lot of our listener stories, this is a high percentage of them yeah. are with these shadow things seen. And it gets to the point where you you kind of get, I got burned out. It just becomes like yeah, so comes common. Background that... noise, almost like Bigfoot to me. Like, yeah, okay, he's there. Right. But it's not, it doesn't feel as real. But then reading these stories of the hat man and digging deeper to find the origins using the date method on search engines to see, okay, when was this first talked about? The hat man. When was this term coined? Because a lot of people think, oh, hat man, that's a fun creepypasta, right? But then we have the work of Heidi Hollis. Yeah. Who kind of came out with it. A lot of people say that she coined this term. She's been studying for a long time. So I wanted to know, did this experience of the hat man without that name exist beforehand? What kind of reality is there? Combine that with all the people who seem to be very affected by this thing. I mean, imagine the terror of being paralyzed at night. And I had to remind myself of all this when I was yeah. rereading it. Chris knows. Oh, yeah. Because you just get worn down by it. But there's a real dark phenomenon happening to a lot of people. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, there's ways to escape the darkness and starve your ghouls. Yes, that is key. It's all based on that negative energy that they feed off of. That's right. In my opinion, that's Nightmare one feeders. of the theories. Fear eaters. I think that, and that's an underlying theme we're going to talk a little bit about later. Just briefly, we'll probably do more in the expansion, but Hungry Ghosts. We'll get into some of Nick Redfern's research. He's got a great book, Paranormal Parasites, The Voracious Appetites of Soul-Sucking Supernatural Entities. And no matter what you're talking about, and Shadow People, the Hatman definitely falls in this category, they are feeders as we talk about feeding on the fear feeding on different aspects of humanity right of, that's of the, the soul of this and that so we're going to get into that as you mentioned heidi's book we're going to look at that the hat man the true story of evil encounters and of course we're going to be touching on jason offutt's book darkness walks the shadow people among us and you guys will remember him jason offutt we covered his work on the episode about dark imaginary friends. Oh, the dark reality of imaginary friends. Yes. And he had a really interesting story in there about someone named Vern who had, when he was a child, seen these people with large fish-like eyes that would walk into his neighbor's homes and no one else could see them. The night people, I think he called them. Yeah, the night people. That was a really good story. Definitely check out that episode. Anyway, great researcher. We'll get, we'll get into these different characters, but let us begin. Let us shine a light into the shadows. Yes. What is the hat man? What are some of these attributes? People have their different theories about what these things are. Right. What is the true nature of this being, right? Is it demonic? Is it interdimensional? Is it, some say, extraterrestrial? Yeah. Oh, and since we're coming up to Halloween, we can't forget the Freddy Krueger connection. Oh, yeah, that's right. We talked about that connection before, the inspiration for the Freddy Krueger character, but I wanted to go into that a little bit because, well, it's that time of year and there's some stuff we hadn't covered previously that's really interesting. It's a Krueger crossover. We'll get to that later. Well, let's, let's go ahead and jump right in with, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Jason's book, Darkness Walks, The Shadow People Among Us, because I want to talk about the cross-cultural references and the experiences throughout time around the world. He's had his own experiences growing up that made him curious, and through his research, he's found stories from North America, England, Portugal, South America, Australia, all over the planet, but he's categorized all these stories into different groups. Groups of shadow people. Groups of shadow people, yes. So this is the way he looks at it. There's benign shadows, shadows that are more indifferent. They don't seem to pay you any mind. There's shadows of terror, which are shadows that terrorize. Um, red-eyed shadows. <laughs> That's very descriptive. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going into super detail on these categories. Oh my gosh. Shadowgories. <laughs> but you guys can do that on your own. I'll have the books linked in here. Uh, he mentions red-eyed shadows, noisy shadows, angry hooded shadows. We just recently covered lots of hooded, hooded shadow figures. Yeah. That's what I saw in my experience was a hooded shadow type creature. Most terrifying night of my life. I'm not going to re- repeat it again. I can link episodes if you guys are interested. Yeah, put a link in the show notes for that. Um, 
the attacking shadows, and of course, the hat man. Which is our focus today. Who is the hat man? What is his relationship to other shadow entities? Because there is certainly aspects to his behavior and his appearance that makes one believe that there is a distinction between the hat man and a general shadow entity. And John, you're familiar with generally what the hat man is, right? What he looks like, his am. attributes. So he's very tall. He's roughly six to seven feet tall, mm-hmm. slender, and has a fedora. Yeah, I've heard fedora. I've heard a uh, wide brim hat. Brim hat. Sort. Yeah, any kind of like older style, you know, round hat. Yeah. Featureless face. Yeah, there's, well, I did hear a couple that had red eyes. Red eyes, yes. That's the one feature you hear when you do hear features. But generally, yeah. Can you imagine just, you know, a dark figure just a shadow yeah. but with a fedora. Like I've heard a couple of people say that he has almost like a tux sort of Suit. upscale dress. Yeah. Some people have reported either trench coat. Trench coat or, and some descriptions that are very specific saying three piece suit. Yeah. That was one of Heidi Hollis's early, like mm-hmm. almost Zorro type esque with a cape sometimes people say. But the general theme of course that's terrifying is the paralyzing fear, the sinister malevolent energy. <laughs> Very angry. Yeah, just malice and just like feeding off of a darkness that's pulling from you, that fear. Yeah. That seems to be the theme. Yes. And when you say no one's seen the face, well, guys, if you want to sign up for the expansion or members, later in the expansion episode, we are going to get to a story from Austin, Texas, actually. A guy who met another guy at a bar, had a couple of drinks and found out that they had both experienced the same thing. But the one who tells the story had seen its face. Mm. And I won't give away what it looks like. And that's from the story from the 80s, right? It happened in 1985. Yeah. Yeah. When they, he experienced it. And that's it. kind of the, one of the focuses of this episode today is finding stories that predate the, more of the trending of this idea. Right. More of the, you know, the internet explosion of Hatman before the meme. What are the accounts that people right. had before this was common knowledge among pop culture? Yeah. Well, that was what I wanted to find. And through the work of Albert Rosales' humanoid database that he has from going back decades and decades, I found a few examples that match so much of what the Hatman is before there was a term. Counts from the 70s, 60s of this thing appearing in people's rooms. All right, before we get into those stories, let's get back into Jason's experience. This is from Jason's book. We'll have it linked in the, in the show notes. I knew about the shadow people long before they became buzzwords on paranormal talk radio and the internet. In the mid-1970s, shadow people have thrust themselves into my life. Decades have passed, but my childhood encounters have fueled my curiosity and driven me to discover what these entities actually are. I make no claims that I know what shadow people are. I approach this topic as a journalist, allowing others, experts, victims, willing participants to tell their stories. In doing so, I hope this book answers some of your questions about the shadow people, and I hope you find comfort in knowing many others have witnessed these entities as well. You are not alone, my friend, anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. You find strength in shared Kinda experience. Like it like when the- <laughs> every episode you got to bring <laughs> them up. I mean, you're right because you've got even you have you have the power of friendship. Yes, yeah, overcomes uh, unity. Yes. So also, Brad Steiger, you guys will remember his name from episodes in the past. He has a really good forward a breakdown of aspects that Jason looks at in this book with some really interesting stuff, like the science of shadow people. He talks to physicists. He talks to theologians. He talks to paranormal experts. It's a really interesting read. And he talks about, and this is, this is why I brought this up, because I want to start getting into the cultural overlaps. He talks about everything from the references of shadow people, shadow entities from the Cherokee to Islam and the Christian faith to the metaphysical shamanistic practices. And that's kind of where we're going to start, because he does a brief mention of this in his book. And then I kind of went on and did a little deeper digging to get a background. That's really interesting. John, will you read this next part here? The metaphysical angle. This is about Carlos Castaneda. In the active side of infinity, anthropologist and author Carlos Castaneda called these shadow entities mud shadows. Castaneda, who cataloged paranormal discussions with his mentor Don Juan, often saw these shadows gathering and dancing at the edge of his vision. That's scary. Yeah, Mm -hmm. pretty common too. Metaphysical author Jack Alice is an expert on Castaneda's writings and said the fear people feel in the presence of shadow people is real and serves a foul purpose. These mud shadows basically feed upon human energy. Okay, so I was like, Carlos Castaneda, I've heard his name before. Who is he? Why is this significant? So Carlos Castaneda, 
He wrote a series of books that purported to be ethnographic accounts describing his apprenticeship with a traditional, quote, man of knowledge, identified as Don Juan Matas, a self-proclaimed Yaqui Indian sorcerer from Sonora, Mexico. This is a quick excerpt from one of Castaneda's works specifically on these mud shadows that we just discussed. John, this is going to be really interesting to you, John. Yes. Because this is going to sound very familiar to The Veil in a way that we just discussed in the last expansion. And this I call Mexican Sorcerer's Perspective. Don Juan explained that the sorcerers see infant human beings as strange, luminous balls of energy. Ooh, this ties into the expansion really well. Luminous balls of energy covered from the top to the bottom with a glowing coat. Something like a plastic cover that is adjusted tightly over their cocoon of energy. He said that the glowing coat of awareness was what the predators consumed. And that when a human being reached adulthood, all that was left of that glowing coat of awareness was a narrow fringe that went from the ground to the top of the toes. That fringe permitted mankind to continue living, but only barely. As if I had been in a dream, I heard Don Juan Mattis explaining that, to his knowledge, man was the only species that had the glowing coat of awareness outside that luminous cocoon. Therefore, he became easy prey for an awareness of a different order, such as the heavy awareness of the predator. He then made the most damaging statement he had made so far, He said that this narrow fringe of awareness was the epicenter of self-reflection, where man was irremediably caught. By playing on our self-reflection, which is the only point of awareness left to us, the predators create flares of awareness that they proceed to consume in a ruthless, predatory fashion. Inane problems that force those flares of awareness to rise, and in this manner, they keep us alive in order for them to be fed with the energetic flair of our pseudo-concerns. Isn't that interesting? pretty dark. Flares of awareness. (laughs) Yes, a light stinger to help that go down easy. Doesn't that sound a lot like we've talked about before as far as like the fear eaters, the nightmare feeders that we've talked about, dogman experiences, things like that? Obviously, well before shadow people, the term is even in the mass consciousness. Yeah, this is Carlos Castaneda in the 1960s. Pretty crazy. In Mexico where he's doing these anthropological studies, allegedly, and this is the thing, it is a contentious thing. A lot of experts debate how much of his accounts, if any, were factual. I mean, how much this Don Juan told him these things? Yeah, well, he was at university writing these electrifying accounts that became really popular. That's why you probably heard his name. And at the time, they were published as nonfiction, and he always claimed that they were nonfiction. But later, some experts have come out and said, well, there are things in his field notes that don't quite match up or you know, this quote looks like it may have been taken from somewhere else. So there is contention. Regardless, here. it's interesting that he's basically describing the shadow person phenomena to a T. Yeah. This kind of energy feeding dark shadows, mud shadows, he calls them. But you're describing the same phenomena that people are experiencing now. So if he made it up, he got real lucky. Or he's touched on something, maybe he had his own experiences. This obviously goes back for hundreds, thousands of years. But he's tapping into something real to a lot of people, regardless yeah. of whether he actually talked to this Don Juan and he told him these things. But I'll leave a link to this excerpt from his work. Really interesting. Yeah. I mean, it goes into some really interesting stuff that's going to sound very familiar and also very, um, he's a good writer, obviously. Well, yeah. And uh, two things I want to mention about that. You mentioned seeing them in the peripheral, which we hear a lot. Mm-hmm. I mentioned this before. If anyone knows where the heck this story is about this doctor who did this study, allegedly, where he blocked out his center focus vision so he could only see out the peripheral. Oh, yeah. And after a period of time, he was seeing these dark shadows haunting him essentially constantly in his peripheral. If anyone has heard that story knows where that comes from, I'd love to cover that, but I have not been able to find it. Uh, Secondly, talking about babies, essentially infants, right? Mm -hmm. Being something to be fed on because they have this energy, this, we call it like a a cloak of luminescence, Mm -hmm. right? Cloak of awareness. Yeah, it gets worn out over time and they continue feeding. Anyways, that's all pretty dark stuff. But in the expansion, guys, we're going to be talking specifically about this topic of the paranormal and the supernatural drawn to pregnant women. And the idea of pregnancy attracting energies, supernatural paranormal forces that are attracted to people that essentially have their foot in two worlds. Shout out to Kat, who actually sent in this topic for a possible idea because she had her own experiences and we'll hear that in the expansion. It's a really interesting topic. It's fascinating. I'll, I'll mention more about it later as we get to the expansion preview, but it's interesting that Castaneda brings this up here. Yeah, it's an interesting tie in there. And you find some uh, cultural connections of your own? Yeah, so this made me curious. I wanted to find some other connections around the world of similar description. And here's, here's an example here I found 
which we probably touched on briefly during our Boogeyman episode, but the Baboa. And by the way, these are probably going to be all incorrect pronunciations. And normally I try to get all those correct, but there's multiple examples here from multiple different regions with different languages. A for effort, Chris. In some Central and Eastern Mediterranean cultures, children who misbehave are threatened with a creature known as Babao. In Italy, it is called the Babao, or Nuomo Nero. And in Romanian, it is called Bua Bua, or Omul Negru, which translates to Black Man. In Italy, he is portrayed as a tall man wearing a heavy black coat, listen carefully, with a black hood or hat, which hides his face. Again, featureless mm-hmm. face, hat or hood, black coat. Sometimes parents will knock loudly under the table, pretending that someone is knocking at the door and say something like, here comes Luomo Nero. He must know that there's a child here who doesn't want to drink his soup. It is also featured in a widespread nursery rhyme in Italy. John, if you would give us the English translation. Lullaby Lala, oh, who do I give this child to? I will give him to the boogeyman who's going to keep him for a whole year. Oh. Luomo Nero is not supposed to eat or harm children, but instead takes them away to a mysterious and frightening place. So obviously this is a cautionary sort of nursery rhyme for the children so that they do as they're told. But does this have roots in a similar phenomenon that we've been discussing all along? Yeah. Like maybe someone down at the local constabulary was hanging out with his friend and he's like, dude, I saw this shadow man (laughs) with a hat who threatened to carry my children off. He's like, hey, that's a great way to scare my kids. They're not drinking their soup. (laughs) Right. Sure, that's how it happened. Yeah, there's little truth in every story. Yeah. And of course, this goes into a bunch of other places around the world throughout time, yada, yada. But the last thing I want to get into when it comes to the cultural connection is a story from Heidi Hulse's book. Her book, The Hat Man, The True Story of Evil Encounters from 2014. She has this really interesting story. This was a story sent to her, right? She'd been collecting them. Yes, this is a story that was sent to her. A really fascinating story that touches on this overarching global phenomenon aspect to this. So she says here, to preface the story, Evil has been written up for eons and the many forms it might come in. There are rules and definitions we place on evil too, though I doubt they play by many rules. With evil having been a prevalent part of our world's history through the written and spoken languages, many speculations brew over the cause of such dark things. So this account was sent to her. Dear Heidi, I am part of the Tuscarora Indian nation of Western New York. The Tuscaroras were the sixth nation to join the Iroquois Confederacy. When I heard you speak of, quote, the hat man on your radio show, it gave me goosebumps. Especially when you said that some people describe him as looking like Abraham Lincoln. For as long as I can recall, there have always been stories of what people on my reservation call the High Hat Man. Everyone who has ever seen him describes him as being very tall, dressed all in black and wearing a high hat, but no one reports ever seeing his face. Sightings of him go back into our history. It's said that if you are under the influence of drugs or alcohol, then you shouldn't talk about him. It's also recommended that you not speak of him at nighttime. I have heard stories from both Tuscarora and the Seneca people that this high hat man lives in swamps. This is kind of an interesting part here. There are some things said to help him stay away. This is why some Senecas even put raw meat in the trees for him. Within my family, there have been two stories told to me about this high hat man. That's disturbing. Yeah, that meat tree thing? Yeah. What is that? So he can feed? Maybe. I I don't know. He's a sucker for a porterhouse. So this is her family experience, one of them. One night, my two cousins, my brother and dad, were out driving around in the woods. Sometime along their drive, my cousins noticed something moving behind them on the road. They kept watching it until it came more within the direct path of the moonlight. That's when they really caught a glimpse of what it was. It was the high hat man. They both then started yelling at my brother to drive faster. My brother couldn't hear exactly what they were saying, so he did the worst possible thing and stopped the truck to ask them. What? My cousins then became even more frantic as they yelled at him. 
Go, go, go! So my brother stepped on the gas to speed up as fast as he could. My cousin said that even though the truck was going faster, the hi-hat man just kept right up with them. What? Yeah, isn't that crazy? Creepy. The weird thing is, though the hi-hat man appeared to be walking at the same pace, he still kept up with them. They said he was so huge that when he walked, he would swing his long arms out towards them. (laughs) That's scary. Isn't that creepy? Almost reaching them. Then all of a sudden, he just faded away. They were all creeped out for days after that. Do you think? Well, that's a lifetime of creep. Yeah. Yeah. That's some trauma right it, there. It's super interesting. And Never it, going on the road again. I keep hearing these stories of the hat man. You always think shadow people bedroom. And there are, of course, accounts yeah. of that with the hat man, especially like when they're, he's just lurking in the doorway or just leaning over you. Mm-hmm. What's really interesting, though, is almost half of the accounts that I came across were specifically hat man on the road in the woods. Me too. In fact, we have one from a listener story we're going to do later on in the episode. And we'll come back to the author Heidi's beliefs about the hat man, what she thinks it is at the end of the episode. There's a part that just came up in my mind about that documentary. It's what is it called? The hat man? Uh, yeah, The Hat Man Documented Cases of Pure Evil from Kyle J. Macias. So there was a lady in the documentary, she commented about how everyone knows about UFO abductions and stuff like that, you know, Bigfoot. But she was just shocked at how many people have had this experience mm-hmm. and it's so, no one knows about yeah, it. Yeah, comparatively to comparatively, like yeah. Bigfoot in the mainstream. There's like hundreds of thousands of, she said that. I don't know right. if that's true. There may only, there may not be nearly that many, but the way she described it, when she looked into it, there's just an insane amount of people that have had oh, yeah, the experience. Definitely thousands. It's probably our most common submission. Yeah, it's it's super hmm. one of our most common. I mean, you search shadow, shadow person people. in our I'm talking about most specifically hat man. Yeah. yeah, we only have a few of those. No, shadow, there's definitely a lot of shadow people. They're all kind of tied together. There's a lot of accounts of the hat man with other shadow folks in tow. You were saying earlier about on the side of the road. Coming up, I have a story that I found 1970s, I believe, in Russia of a roadside hat man encounter with a, a couple on their scooter. But it's, it's oddly similar to this as far yeah. as, you know, seeing this thing on this, why on the sides of roads? Anyways, we'll, we'll get to that. It seems like he can, he's not just in your bedroom. Kind of creepy. He's on, on the highway. And yeah, one of the creepiest stories I think we've ever done took place on the highway with one of these hat men. That was in episode 3.8, Highway Horror and Roads to Elsewhere. We'll have that linked. Oh, that's right. But let's get back to the topic at hand. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Nick Redfern's work in his book, Paranormal Parasites, uh, he talks about the Hungry Ghost connection, which we'll probably touch on more in the expansion. But basically the concept, if you're not familiar with the Hungry Ghost, um, it's not super well known in the West. That's because the phenomenon is very much one that has its origins in India and the Far East. According to Nick Redfern, with the roots in Sikhism, Buddhism, Jainism, Taoism, Hinduism, and other faiths and religions, the Hungry Ghost concept is one known to various nations and cultures and has been for a very long time. Even Samhain. If you think about it, even Halloween has roots in the hungry ghost concept. Oh, right. Right. Feeding the spirits to keep them at bay, to appease them. And of course, this brings up the concepts of the succubus and the incubus, which will tie into your expansion a bit. We'll get into more of that in the future, but it relates directly to this phenomenon, things that are feeding. Yeah. Consistent accounts of shadow people, specifically the hat man. Parasites. Yes. Vampires. Yes. And this brings me to a story that also, Jeremy, takes place well before the memes of shadow people and the hat man. Before it was in the modern consciousness and the lexicon of the paranormal. Yes. But I thought this was interesting. This comes from his book. St. Augustine, a noted philosopher and Christian theologian, was born in 354 and died in 430. He commented on this issue. In a post called, quote, whether the angels have bodies naturally united to them, the words of St. Augustine are quoted. Many persons affirm that they have had the experience or have heard from such as have experienced it, (laughs) that the satyrs and fauns, whom the common folk call incubi, have often presented themselves before women and have sought and procured intercourse with them. Hence, it is folly to deny it. So this is interesting. Nick brings this up because this, this relationship to the succubus and the incubi and the fauns and the satyrs, just interesting that this was commented on way back in the 400s, you know, the 5th century. It's kind of one of the first written accounts. We know that the succubus and the incubus, those concepts go back to Mesopotamia, 
But this is one of the first written accounts where someone of authority is referencing the incubi. Yeah, so just just kind of interesting. I thought it was kind of a neat um, it little to extract. The be- beginning of time. He even talks about like Lilith, right? Yeah, oh yeah, it gets really into that. Yeah, you guys should check out his book. We'll leave a link in the show notes to Nick Redfern's book, Paranormal Parasites. Definitely recommend it. It goes deeper than a lot of books out there on this topic. Yeah, for sure. And this takes me to the first story I want to do from Nick's book. And he says because of his extensive writing on the men in black phenomenon, which we've talked about, and the, the tie-ins there, he often gets accounts that seem to be more shadow person and often hat man related. And this is one such account, quote, I'll share with you several such cases, all of which make a strong argument for the idea that the primary interaction between us and the shadow people is feeding. And we're the banquet. So this story is about Margaret, a school teacher who lives in a small town in Wales. And this happened in 1967. I call this, It Breathes You In. In 1967, Margaret was 25 years old and working and living in the English city of Bristol. All was looking good for Margaret. She had moved from her home city of Norwich, England to Bristol to take on a new job teaching five to eight-year-old children. (laughs) The work was fun. The kids were well-behaved and all was well, except when night fell. Margaret was hardly rich, so she rented a small room at a 19th century three-story house on the fringes of the city. Only two nights after moving into the building, Margaret inexplicably woke up in the early hours of the morning. This was not typical for Margaret, who rarely ever had sleep issues. She put it down to nothing stranger than the move to a new environment and the new job. Nevertheless, she was at a loss to explain why she woke up in a state of overwhelming terror. Her heart was racing, and the bed sheets were soaked with sweat. After an hour or so, she managed to get back to sleep. Even more disturbing, though, upon waking up when her alarm clock rang, Margaret developed a sudden feeling that there had been someone in the room. She didn't have any kind of conscious recollection of a particular identifiable intruder, though. It was just an uneasy, hard-to-define feeling. That all changed on the next night. It was hardly surprising that when Margaret went to bed the following night, her sense of unease, which had pretty much gone away during the day when her mind was focused on looking after a classroom full of kids, returned in spades. She tried to put out of her mind and went to sleep. Three or four hours later though, Margaret was wide awake. To her terror and horror, she found herself pinned to the bed by a shadowy figure. It held her by the wrists and wore a large black brimmed hat. The unearthly thing straddled Margaret and moved its face toward her. She said, I couldn't see anything at all. The face was just dark. Things got worse. Although the monster appeared in the shadow form, it bent even closer to her and kissed her on the lips. Margaret tried to scream as the thing put its black lips to hers, and in Margaret's own words, began to take my life away, as if it was pulling the life out of me. Then suddenly the shadow was gone. Over the course of the next few months, the very same thing happened on four subsequent occasions. And this is a common thing in these accounts, is that the feeling of your life essence being sucked out of you. And he finishes with this interesting part here. The weirdest part, however, was that on one occasion, as the shadow prepared to exit the room, it morphed into the form of a large black cat. then leapt off the bed and vanished into the darkness of the room. Weird, huh? Yeah. It's really interesting because Nick Redfern ties this into the tales, the folklore of cats stealing breath of newborns, which we've kind of briefly touched on before. Watch your babies. Connects to that idea of, yeah, being drawn to that kind of nascent energy of a new life. Yeah, I don't know if you guys heard about this, but way back when in 1233, Pope Gregory IX maintained that cats were in league with the devil and had as many killed as was conceivably possible. Oh, that's super sad. 
The unforeseen result of this was the development of legend that breath stealing demonic breath stealing cats, demonic yeah. cats. So that was I, I thought kind of an interesting historical marker. But there's connections to this mythology that goes all the way back to the stories of Lilith and transforming into a demon cat. So you're saying Pope Gregory might have been right to murder all those cats. No. I mean, cats can be like selfish and isolated. But That's true. Yeah, I'm more of a dog guy, but I wouldn't say eradicate the species. I've had some cool cats, but in general. I'm in general, more yeah, of a dog it's guy. kind of like, you know, you're, it's a risk you might want to take. Uh, John, just read this last paragraph here. And this is how Nick ends the story here. Thankfully, Margaret was never again assaulted by the hat man. By the way, she and her husband of 43 years, Joe, share their property in Wales with a parakeet and a semi-tame fox that lives in the woods at the back of their home but not a single cat. No surprise. <laughs> that was good. Having three or four times, I don't know how you could ever sleep again. Yeah, it's crazy. It is such a common thing. And I'm people that experience common. this are often repeatedly victimized I'm by this. I'm glad I haven't had that experience. Well, I think part of it too is that, you know, there's a lot of skeptical explanation that discusses, which we'll get into later, you know, sleep paralysis, hallucinations, the hypnagogic state, things like this. But um, and so I think a lot of people just brush it off as like, I don't want to think about it. It's obviously it's something psychological. It's something just to do with my you know, too much caffeine, not getting enough sleep, right. that sort of thing, which I, in some cases I think is true. But like I also see think, shadows and things that aren't there. Quick, right. quick bits of things when you're on low sleep. But I also think that there is a reality to this when you look, especially when you look at the patterns across the world. The common time. themes. And even when people have these experiences who have no inkling of shadow people, which is such a common thing as we've discussed. And also... When you have different cultures talking about a man in a fedora, who maybe don't know what a fedora is, that happens too. Or just a brimmed hat in general. Right. And the roadside connection is odd because it just reminds me of our, the expansion episode we did on the dark watchers of the California coast. They were described in a very similar way. You know, faceless, black, shadow-like people with these big hats. Yeah. Fascinating, man. So we're going to take a, a quick break. When we come back, we're going to dive deeper into the hat man phenomenon. We're going to talk about accounts through the decades around the world, as well as accounts from our own listeners, skeptical takes, and then questions to consider. The questions we brought up at the beginning, what is this thing? What's this phenomenon? What's the purpose? What's behind it? Jeremy, what's coming up in the expansion, bro? Jeez, I'm glad you asked, John. Expansion is going to be really interesting, guys. A couple of things that we're going to tie up from this episode that we won't have time for, I'm sure, is the true identity of the hat man. According to Jeff in Austin, who reported it to Coast to Coast in 2018, he saw this thing in 1985. His story is interesting. So if you want to have the face of the hat man revealed, check that out. But the major theme of the expansion is uh, haunted bellies. <laughs> the connection between pregnancy and the paranormal. I hope that's the name you're going with. Don't snicker. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, kudos to Kat, who um, had her own experiences with the paranormal that seemed to increase in intensity and frequency specifically when she was pregnant and specifically seeing shadow people. Really interesting story from her. And then because of what she experienced, she reached out to other people who were pregnant asking if they experienced the same thing. And to her horror, they had also experienced similar things. So we have some stories from actual people that she knows talking about this thing and analyzing the strange pattern of attachment that seems to be there. The supernatural and the paranormal attachment to those carrying the living and breathing connections between the two worlds. We're also just going to talk about more paranormal parasites in general, some other unique accounts of strange things. So if you guys are interested in more of that, go to bleeful.com and click on the big red join the expansion button, and we will see you there. And now, enjoy this clip of the expansion episode. Access granted. Do you guys want to read this next one? This comes from Ash Gould from the Baby Center Forum. Before I was pregnant, I would hear voices whispering. A bang on the sunroom door connected to the kitchen. Footsteps and other things, but it seemed to get worse when I was pregnant. I would wake up around 4 a.m. to drink some water by my bed, and I would hear tapping in my living room like someone was knocking. I would feel like someone was following me or watching me. Now since my daughter will be one soon, she babbles to no one, points her finger to the corner of her room, and has her finger follow something. That would be creepy. Yeah, very creepy. I have also heard a woman whispering for almost five minutes through the baby monitor Ew. around 1 a.m. Nothing harms her, but I have yelled in my house for whatever is in the room to stay out. Stay out of here! 
Ah, oh, there you go. She used her will. Mm-hmm. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. I hope it was restful. I hope your energy is restored after these energy-sucking parasites of the hat men and the shadow people we've been talking about. Yeah, let's get back to the accounts with some from our very own listeners. This first story comes from Cameron Presley, and this took place in Rockingham, North Carolina, in November 2021. Last November, my husband and I went out for a late evening drive around the countryside of our town. There isn't much to do in our neck of the woods, so most of us grew up traveling these winding black roads for fun as teenagers. In this particular part of the county, you won't find many homes, street lights, or other cars for that matter. If by chance you do see a house, it will be deep within the trees. The forests here are dense, and while driving through them at night, you have no sight past the tree line. While out for a drive, we were talking back and forth about nothing in particular when we approached a stop sign. Black nothingness surrounded our car as we were encased in the walls of trees on either side. As we neared the stop sign, the beams from our headlights lit up a man standing on the side of the street in complete blackness. He was scarily close to our car and did not even flinch as we approached. He was tall, thin, wearing a long black trench coat and tall brim black hat. His clothes did not fit in with our time period and was far too fancy to be from around here. He looked like he had stepped out of a movie from the 50s. He was facing the abandoned plantation homestead across the street, buried deep within the trees. For a split second, I thought I saw a reflection from glasses, yet it had no facial features I could recognize. It was otherworldly, as he was so out of place. No houses or cars around except ours. He was just standing in total darkness the type of darkness where you can't see your hand in front of your face. My husband didn't see him, and I screamed from the sudden shock and realization of it all. Probably a bad decision on my part. I felt instantly terrified. This was straight out of a horror film. I screamed at my husband not to stop, to just drive, because there was a man standing in the pitch black beside our car. He drove off without stopping, and I couldn't help but look back. My heart was pounding as I turned my head to look out the back window of our car. What I saw still haunts me to this day. There he was, still unmoving, just staring off to the other side of the road like we never even passed him, frozen. I watched as the red lights faded on him as he faded back into the pitch black night, encased in dense forest. He appeared to be physical, but had an otherworldly feeling to him. Evil and misplaced in time. I remember feeling sick, like I needed to get as far away from that location as soon as possible. I didn't even want to go home, afraid something would follow. We drove straight to town, and I surrounded myself with people in shops, just trying to shake that awful encounter. Since then, I refused to travel that particular road at night. What scares me the most is that was not my first encounter with the hat man, nor my family's although the other encounters are more spiritual. He goes back with us for generations. He is well known and has always shown up in the most unwanted places. He seems to show up when you are most vulnerable or easily startled. He appears to the women of my family mostly, myself included. I always pray him away fiercely. Whatever the case, I have no clue what it is, nor do I wish to find out. Cameron. That's an excellent description. Yeah. Super creepy. So that sounds like a generational parasite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what in that documentary, it said the, it seems like they're attracted to bloodlines. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. It's interesting because it kind of parallels the abduction phenomenon. A little oh, yeah. Bit. They have these throughout time, these experiences in family bloodlines. That's super creepy. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, it makes you think about so many different possibilities like family curses or yeah, the abduction scenario. Is there some sort of DNA, some sort of genetic trail? that these things are following. It is weird too, because I was looking through Albert Rosales' Humanoids book for stories like this, and there are a few that match the hat man, just figure all in black, trench coat, hat, 
One in particular where he visited a pregnant woman and removed the baby so she could hold it and then put it back inside. Oh, weird. There were two accounts like that in different decades. Definitely sounds abduction-like. Yeah, very strange. Like, what is the fascination with the child and the bloodline? That's really interesting aspect you don't really hear very often yeah. when it comes to these. Real, thank you so much for that story, Cameron. That was really freaky. Definitely. And there's so many interesting things to talk about when it comes to that. The whole concept behind these entities, are they extra dimensional, extraterrestrial? Right. Out of time. And how many of these things that we talk about that feed on people, black eyed kids, shadow people, dogmen, succubus, even. dogmen, how much of these things are related in some way? Right. The ultra terrestrial idea. Right. They have the same sort of purpose in coming to you in the evening and, mm -hmm. and, and feeding on your energy. Just different patrons to their favorite ethereal extra dimensional restaurant, which is the human race. Right. Yeah. Let's go to the next story. All right. This one is also from a listener of ours, Eric Gray. Called Hat Man. I couldn't think of a title in time. Cool. <laughs> cool name. This took place at his old house in 2016. I was around 12 years old. It was at my old house. My old house had all sorts of weird stuff going on. Like my mom and dad hearing a little girl run around the house, trying to play with them. And my sister's door slamming shut on occasion, without explanation. One night I was just laying in bed at around 10 p.m. and I fell asleep. I woke up around two hours or so later but as I opened my eyes, I saw a guy just turning to walk away. I realized he had been almost face to face with me before I opened my eyes, maybe two to three feet away from my face. This man had what looked like a bowler hat or a fedora. He was all dark black and I couldn't make out any features. Anyways, this dark man just continued to turn and walked out of my room. I was laying there in fear, but I eventually mustered up enough courage to say, Dad! Then I repeated it around three to four times. There was no reply. Then I thought to myself, maybe it was my mom. So I yell, Mom! And still no reply. So I eventually fell asleep. The next day after school, when both of my parents were home, I asked them if they had been in my room from the previous night. Both of them said, no. I kind of chuckled because I thought that one of them was joking with me. But when I asked again, they insisted they hadn't been. Fast forward four years. We had moved to another state. My mom and I were waiting at the DMV to get our license plate changed. And I had asked my mom if anything weird ever happened at our old house. She had replied with, Yeah, we had a spirit of a little girl that once lived in our house. My mom said she was about four years old and she was a playful little girl. Both of my parents never saw her, but would always hear her and feel her. The little girl would rock my mom and try to get her to play with her at night, and my dad had his sock pulled. I've heard these two entities are related. I'd like to know what your guys' thoughts are. Keep up the hard work. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. You know, I didn't find anything in relation to the hat man and little, little girl as mm -hmm. far as the experiences have gone. If this is indeed the hat man and not a run-of-the-mill ghost. Right. Yeah. What I have heard is the, you know, the, the well-known creepypasta slender man attachment with children, the relationship there, the, the steward of the children in the dark forest, that kind of thing. Oh, right. Maybe later became a tulpa situation. Right, because he started as a creepypasta. Right. Could potentially be a tulpa. That's an argument that's made. Could manifest himself into reality. Either way, has had some dark effects on society. Yeah. But not specifically haven't, I haven't heard, but uh, not to say that that isn't. If you guys are familiar with that, feel free to reach out. Yeah, let us know. But that's a great story. Thank you, Eric, for that. I have a couple encounters here that I found that adds, I think, more credibility to the stories because I found these before the term hat man entered into the lexicon, the modern mainstream paranormal language, if you will. These both come from Albert Rosales's database of humanoid encounters that I searched through. The first one I call No Vacancy the 1970s hat man encounter. This happened in Delhi, Ontario, Canada in May of 1971. Two young girls were sharing a motel room for a couple weeks when one night, one of them, Mary, woke up paralyzed. She then heard the doorknob rattling and felt a strange energy in the room, which was filled with a dull red, warm glow. At the corner of the room, she could see a tall man wearing a black long coat and a large black hat that covered most of his face. 
Her last memory was of the man standing right next to the bed. So, follows the pattern. Sounds very familiar. She had other weird experiences directly following this she thought was related, like being followed by three tall, peculiarly acting men. That ties more to the men in black stuff. But here it is, 1970s, uh, 1971, you have an encounter. Right. Especially the appearing in the room, red warm glow. That's something I've experienced with astral spiders. Mm -hmm. We've talked about before. Climbing down the walls, giant spiders, people. But that's a common phenomenon when you're coming out of the hypnagogic state, maybe exiting this other realm, there's this red light that seems to glow in the room and grow. So that, that struck me yeah. in that story. And my final story that I brought today is called Hat Man in the Flesh. And this mirrors our listener story, Cameron's experience. Chris, do you want to read this one? Sure. This comes from Mr. and Mrs. Kardashev. It occurred in September 1989 in Yakutsk, East Siberia, Russia. A Mr. Kardashev and his wife were riding their motor scooter on an isolated forestry trail road amid the forest outside of the city on their way to gather mushrooms and berries. Suddenly, they saw a very tall man near the road. He wore a dark colored coat that hung to the ground that completely covered his body and a dark hat on top of his head. He was walking very slowly and straight, not turning around. The woman told her husband to use caution since the tall stranger was walking near the road. They noticed right away that the man was unnaturally tall, almost three meters in height. As they neared the tall stranger, he suddenly disappeared in plain sight. And at the same time, the scooter fell to the ground, its engine suddenly cutting off. The stunned pair stood up and checked their scooter and was surprised as the scooter engine suddenly started by itself. As they drove further on, the woman attentively looked on both sides of the road, but did not see any more strange men. Weird, yeah. Yeah. Definitely supernatural there, shutting off the scooter and then disappearing in the moment. Yeah, Shadow Man, same thing. Who Reminds knows? Reminds a UFO encounter where you have the automobile shut down spontaneously, and then it leaves and it turns back on. Something electrical about these things. Some energy, it seems like, in a lot of this phenomena. Very interesting. Um, I thought it was important on this episode to just touch on the skeptical argument here. Oh yeah, we're going to get more to that in the expansion. Right. Because we're going to have, I think, disputed a little as well. Yeah, which we're going to hear a little bit too. But this first one, you know, in that documentary, John, that you were mentioning earlier, Rosemary Ellen Guiley talks about this, the skeptical concepts. And she talks about how, you know, a lot of skeptics talk about how this is probably remnants of a nightmare. You're waking nightmare. You your, your body's still... Sleep paralysis. Right. Your, your, your body's still asleep. And your mind is waking up and they're kind of converging there. Specifically with the encounters in the bedroom, not roadside, but while you're coming right. out of consciousness. And she talks about how the global experience, the patterns of these things, they aren't explained by the sleep paralysis. But I want to talk about this specific article here. It's called Why Everyone Around the World is Having the Same Nightmare. This is from Quartz. And this is discussing sleep paralysis and hallucination. It's an incredibly common sleep problem. An estimated 8% of people experience it regularly. And some estimates have placed the number of the people who have at least one experience of it in their lifetime as high as 40%. Many who experience sleep paralysis also experience hypnagogic hallucinations, vivid images perceived in the transition from wakefulness to sleep or the other way around. Spiders, Jeremy like you, mm -hmm. or insects crawling up the walls is a particularly common such vision. According to Alon Avedan, a professor of neurology at the University of California, Los Angeles, and director of the UCLA Sleep Disorder Center, so are human-shaped figures. These episodes are often accompanied by profound senses of fear and anxiety, and a sense that something is trying to harm the sleeper. Quote, What they're seeing is very real to them, and they're reacting to the image in a way that seems to be very similar across individuals, across cultures, and across geographies. Sleep science can't yet explain why the brain serves up the specific image as it does in dreams, Avidan said. And this is key here. Nor why multiple people across cultures might experience the same dream or nightmare. So the article doesn't seem to Blame explain it after all. Like the title seems to insinuate that they're, and we'll link the whole article. Yeah. But it's just interesting. It's like, again, we have the same problem that Rosemary Ongali was talking about, that we've been talking about. We haven't been able to explain how people around the world throughout time are having the same type of dream. And seeing like astral spiders, what a, you know, of course we can talk about like innate fears right. in our psychology through evolution or whatever, but I think it's really interesting that this has not been explained. Yeah. Some attributes unique to the hat man. 
And the expansion will definitely have more. I think there's some specific things that have come, like skeptical arguments that are really interesting. Yeah, there's a fascinating trial. You're going to talk about that, that neurologist study with the region of the brain. Yeah, they were doing an epileptic evaluation. And that's really fascinating what they discover there. But we'll kind of take that apart a little bit. Um, last thing I want to mention here that you guys will recognize from, especially coming into Halloween here, the connection with the Freddy Krueger movies. Oh, yeah. Which we've talked about before, right? Yeah. The section I entitled The Shadow of Freddy Krueger, Real Inspiration for Craven's Nightmare. Now, I didn't know that this had three elements to it. We talked about this briefly before. The Asian death syndrome, we talked about that. Yeah, in 1981, there was a news that came out of this medical mystery, if you will, and it was reported in the New York Times, Los Angeles. At that time, a few dozen people had unexpectedly died in their sleep for unknown reasons. Right. And these men that all died, they were all healthy, young, and curiously, all of Asian descent. And it became known as the Asian death syndrome. By the time Nightmare on Elm Street hit theaters, there was over 100 cases of people dying inexplicably in their sleep. Wes Craven apparently read the story, a specifically a story in 1981 about a specific Hmong refugee family that fled the killing fields and came to America. And I guess their son had been having terrible dreams. And he, quote, this comes from Craven, he says, quote, he told his parents he was afraid that if he slept, the thing chasing him would get him. So he tried to stay awake for days at a time. When he finally fell asleep, his parents thought this crisis was over. Then they heard screams in the middle of the night. By the time they got to him, he was dead. He died in the middle of a nightmare, Craven said. I remember that story. So there's that. That's terrifying enough. Of course, the other element, the name comes from a bully in school, Fred Krueger. Oh, really? Kid in school. That's, That's crazy. Gone. Yeah. So he's like, oh, I'll give you the name That's of this. That's ultimate revenge. You're going to yeah. make you the most notorious villain of all time. Yeah. Or one of I should say. I think the one other interesting thing, the, the actual, this kind of is freaky, this goes along the lines of our episode, and just how people can be scarier than the paranormal at times. Maybe they're influenced by the paranormal at times. Uh, he had an experience when he was a kid with a strange man wearing the same kind of hat. That's where he gets the hat, oh, right. inspiration for Freddy. He assumes that this guy was drunk. This man had come down the sidewalk to his window where he was sleeping, woke him up. He said he felt somehow the man knew he was there. And he goes on to say, quote, he just basically somehow knew I was up there in my window and he looked right into my eyes I went back and hid for what I thought was hours I finally crept back to the window and he was still there then he started walking almost half backwards so that he could keep looking at me oh, weird. down to the corner and turned I suddenly realized my god that's the direction of the entrance to our apartment building I literally ran toward the front door and heard two stories down, the front door open. I woke up my big brother. He went down with a baseball bat and nobody was there. Probably the guy heard him coming and ran. He was drunk, having a good time. But the idea of an adult who was frightening and enjoyed terrifying a child was the origin of Freddy. Weird. Now that's interesting because that kind of ties into the whole idea of Very feeding much so, on fear. Yeah. Because even people can do that at times. I mean, it's fun to scare people. Yeah. We've talked about that before. Interesting stuff. And much more to look into and explore with us in the expansion. Absolutely, come on guys. Over. Head on over or Freddy will come get you. <laughs> yeah, it's a personal <laughs> threat. John used to sing that song to me. It always scared me as a kid. One, two, Don't do it. Coming for <laughs> I didn't want you to start. Three, four, become a belief whole expansion member. <laughs> You're going to say something else. It's interesting, the hat. We talked about this before, but the hat is interesting. Like, why the hat? And I always thought it was kind of interesting to consider, like, what is under the hat? Is there something that's being hidden? You know, is there some sort of, like, revelation that would occur if you saw, you know, what's, are there horns mm -hmm. under there? Is that, you know, is, I mean, that's uh, Heidi Hall's belief that it, it's the devil himself. He's oh, right. That basically, the shadows are his army that are terrorizing people. Tons of different explanations from different researchers, and these books will be linked, but a lot of strange accounts. I'm sure we'll do more in the future, too. But it's not all for naught. There are things you can do. That's true. Remember what they said in the documentary, John, but there are ways to avoid the hat man. Or fight them off. Mm -hmm. Obviously, prayer, depending on your prayer taker of choice, is an option. It seems to help. PMA, positive mental attitude. That's another one, PMA. <laughs> okay, you I like, it. like that. <laughs> also, just keeping electronics on at night, which is probably not good for uh, your uh, physical body. But for your, apparently, if you're being attacked by a hat man, it's good to keep on lights. Sometimes I feel like they can travel through electricity, though. Yeah. I mean, there are stories of them obviously like interacting in front of lights. That's how you know that I mean, they're not just a shadow. They but feed off of bad emotions. So, that's the key. Yeah. I mean, that's what it all comes down to. Yeah. If you can get yourself out of that lower vibrational state, you're less likely to become a, a meal. Yeah. yeah. Hate, anger, rage, yeah, jealousy. These things, these things seem to target 
the people that are most vulnerable in the most amount of trauma and stress right. and darkness. So go to your happy you know, place. Basically kicking you when you're down. Exactly. Yeah. And another great thing is humor. You know, yeah. again, this, this is a, to a serious topic and people have real traumatic experiences. Uh, we use humor in the show. And one of the reasons is because it's the best way to fight against real paranormal threats. Exactly. You know, like in It when they... <laughs> yeah, there we yeah. go. Uh -huh. What's that movie? <laughs> the opposite of fear is laughter and love. Starve your ghouls, feed your love slugs. Starve your ghouls, people. You know it well. Eat, eat it up, love slugs. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Oh, love slugs. Love slugs. Yeah. Feed them. Anyway, thank you guys for joining us on this journey. Join us in the expansion. We have some people to thank who are our Black Eyed Cool Kid members and up and up. Supporters of the show who spend a little extra money, get a shout out on the show, get double the content, and really help us stay alive. Thank you so much. Yep. All right, guys. Thank you to Karen Shaw. All right, Karen Shaw. I'll wear you. On my neck. <laughs> Special member of the show. <laughs> Sorry, it's not a weird. You know what I mean. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. We love you, Karen. Thanks for yes. being here. Jones the Gray. Welcome to be here. Yes. My favorite color. Yes. Neat. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you yes. so much, man. Nick Day. Nick yes. Day. Uh, New Day is born with New Nick. New Day is here. Thank you so much, Nick. We really appreciate you, buddy. Better than the night. Uh, we have Elias Zakari. Welcome to be here, sir. Hello, Zakari. Yes. Elias. We love you. It's his name backwards. It's your name backwards. Yes, it is. Uh, Ingrid Dean. Yes. Oh, old time friend. Ooh, upgraded tier. Welcome oh, in. Oh, thanks, Ingrid. We love you. Nice to hear from you again. Absolutely. Yes. In the form of money. <laughs> in the form of money. <laughs> no, we love we love Ingrid. Yeah, seriously. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, another familiar name, Tracy Haas. All right, Tracy. Oh, yeah. Tracy. Mm -hmm. Nice to hear from you. BH All Star. Yeah, she's great. She's got some great stories we got to get to at some point. Yes. Thank you, Tracy. We appreciate it. Amanda Gauthier. Ooh, fancy. Fancy name. Are you sure that's how you pronounce it? Nope. <laughs> Bad with Amanda's. Got here. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing, but we appreciate you being here, Amanda. You're a hero. Oh, she's a dogman whisperer, so ding, ding, roof, roof. That's a special one right there. <laughs> <laughs> Ding, ding, You're a woof, special woof. one, Jeremy. You're a special <laughs> that one. That sounds so stupid. I'm sorry. Just keep going. You're better than me. Uh, Robert <laughs> <laughs> Robert Wellosen is here. Oh, right. Robert, I've been waiting for you. What's yes. up, Robbie? Yes. Oh, it's so good yes. to have you, my Welcome friend. Yes. Hobby Robbie. Yes. Yes. We appreciate yes. you. Yes. 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 Uncle Slummer. Mm. Uncle, uncle Slummer's back. Up in his yes. pledge. Oh, is he up in? He must be. He made it to the list. Thank uh, you, Uncle. Uncle. Thank you, Uncle. Thank you, Uncle. <laughs> uh, uncle Slummer. We, we love you, buddy. He's been around for a while, right? He has. Matthew Toth. Oh, Matthew Toth. Matthew, I feel like Matthew. Is that yes. an upgrade? Upgrade. Yes. Welcome in. Ding, ding. Matthew, thank you. We couldn't do it without you, Matthew brother. Toth, the man from Hoth. Excellent. Colby Peters. Colby oh. Peters. All oh, right, my favorite cheese. I feel like I love him. Yeah, <laughs> you look like you love him. <laughs> you Why is the shirt coming off? <laughs> What's going on, John? <laughs> thank you, Colby. Selena. All right. Welcome to be here, Selena. Selena, right. sing we... us a song. Yeah. Hey know. there. There's some singing Selena's. There That's are a lot fair. of singing Selena's. Selena's a famous singer. Yes. Yeah. There's a couple, right? Selena Gomez. Yes. Let's keep going. Selena yes. Dion. Okay. Yes. Keep going. Okay. Yes. Uh, Will. Selena Dion. <laughs> Will Florence is yes. here. <laughs> All right, Will Florence. Welcome, buddy. What a beautiful city in Italy. What a beautiful name for a beautiful man. Good to That's have where you. all the artisans learn their craft. Thank you for being here. A dog man whisperer at our door, Dimitri Adobe. Ooh, keep that door shut. Whoa. Don't let him in. Keep that Photoshop up. Photoshop? Oh, Dobie? No, it's not Adobe. It's oh, Dobie. 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 Sorry. Anyways, Demetria, thank you so much. We appreciate you so yes, much. Yes, 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 yes. Another dog man whisper, Genie Link. Jean, Li Jean Link? Jean Link is a link to my soul. Jean yes. Link. Welcome in. I love how we start off lightning round and then we slowly get slower <laughs> and slower throughout it. All right, let's keep it keep up pace. Okay. Thank you so much, Gene. You are awesome. Tyler Jones. Yes. All right. I'm Jones and for you, Jonesy. Welcome in. Absolutely. Kayla Harmier. Oh, right. Harmier. Yes. Harmier. Hey, Kayla. Awesome. Remember the Kayla I didn't like. Kayla is a pretty name for a pretty girl. Here it oh, goes. It could be Kayla. <laughs> it could be Kayla or Kayla. Kayla. Regardless, you are awesome. John, you're such a tease. I am. Dogman Whisperer Amanda Blanchett. All right. Amanda, you are so pretty. <laughs> It's just, it's just saying, uh, I'm just, just blanket female attractive compliments. If I say I'm just kidding, that's not good That's either. true. We don't know what you look like, but you sound beautiful. You're all beautiful. Pretty's on the inside anyway. You know who else is beautiful? Pretty's on the inside. JD Ledbetter. Yes. All right. Hey, we're going to go see our friend Craig Ledbetter in a moment. That's true. Maybe he doesn't want his name read though. Isn't that awesome. a Pearl Jam song? Ledbetter yes. or Bed Letter? Welcome in. Well, we're glad to love have you. you. Love you, love yeah, you. Yeah, thank you so much, JD. Nathan Schultz, welcome to be here, Dogman Whisperer. Yes. All right, yes. 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 Pull up those Schultz. Yes. yes. 
<laughs> what? I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nathan. <laughs> so you are awesome. The speech impediment. Pull those shorts, <laughs> Nathan. <laughs> uh, Rosalinda Valdez, yes. welcome to be here, yes. milady. Yes. Welcome to be here. We love you for being you. Yes, thank you so much for being here. You are awesome. Leland Callan. Oh. Leland. Elegant yeah. and masculine. Cool name. name. Yes. Lalan Callan. Yes. The Dark Knight. Yes. Welcome, my friend. Good to see you. Uh, Talon D. Glotzner. Ow. Talons are sharp. Welcome in. <laughs> Ripping me up, bro. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, my friend. Uh, Sarah Foley. Hi. Ah. Oh, cool. Do you make sound effects? Yeah. Foley sound effects. Yes. That's a term in sound design. You you must look it up if you don't know about it. Yes, but Sarah, you are. You will not scare us. You're vitally important to the hole. Keep going. Mandy Wood. All right. Back in the hole. Get some logs, Mandy. Yes. Because your name is Wood. Oh, God. That's so bad. <laughs> but we love you, Mandy. Yeah, a long time Get uh, some member. logs. Yeah. <laughs> what are you? <laughs> it's the worst verbal vomit I've ever Welcome. Heard. Welcome back. Uh, but it's great to see you again, Mandy. Thank you. Elizabeth Spicer. All right. Elizabeth Spicer. Oh, Elizabeth. Spice my rack. Mm. Yes. What? Oh, spice rack. I get it. Yeah. That's good. It sounds sexual, but it's not. Welcome in. Thank you so much for being here. We really do appreciate it. Rachel, where did you go? Oops. Rachel, where'd you go? <laughs> I actually deleted the name. Rachel Gunn. Ooh. Ooh, bang, she probably bang. hates that reference. Yeah. I forget all the time. Rachel, yes. keep it in the holster, Rachel. Yes, thank you for being a dogman whisperer. We, oh, thank you. Uh, Mrs. E. Vane. Ooh. Like a vein? Mysterious. Like V A N E. I'm the yes. spelling our patrons' names. <laughs> Her address is. <laughs> Sorry, Rachel. No, that's, that's, we already said Rachel. This is Mrs. E. Vane. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mrs. E. Vane. Mr. A. Barzokas. Ooh, cool. Ooh. That is a cool name. Cool. Dogman Whisperer. Welcome in, sir. Welcome to be here. I like these misters and misters. I know. What's going on with that? Back to back. Keep going. Give me a second, brother. You read next time. Shard Harmon. Shard yes. my Harmon? Shard. Shard. <laughs> Sounds like a generic toilet paper company. That's not a complimentary <laughs> thing to say to her. In a good way, though. Generous patrons. Very gentle on your bottom. There you go. Thank you, Sean Harmon, for being soft and supportive. Yes. Tavis Sylvester. Yes. Welcome to the show. All right. Ooh. Welcome to be here. Yes. yes Tavis. Yes. My brother. Yeah, yeah, yes. Lance Olds. Mm. Ooh. Welcome, yes. Lance. Older the better, that's what I say. Excellent. He does. <laughs> he says it often. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Uh, Sheila Loya, I think I remember you. Oh, yeah, up in the pledge. Thank you, OG, being here a long time. We you appreciate you. You're a very you. special person, Sheila. We love you. Yes. Get out your arrows, Cupid, because it's Nancy Hart. Oh, oh, shot through the heart, and Nancy's too late. It's spelled differently, but just as loving. Welcome to be here, Nancy. Jonathan Piazza. All oh, right. I love your first name because it's my first name. I love your last name because I enjoy spending time in Piazzas. Yes. Sure. I like pizza. Okay. Yes. Welcome to be here. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> William Smart. All right. Ooh. As unlike us, you are Mr. Smart. That's not true. You're very smart. You have a big head. Are you talking to me? I have a yes. big head. Yeah. I do have a big I have head. a big brain. I have a bulbous head. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, William Smart. <laughs> Melissa M. Koss. Welcome, Melissa. That's one of my favorite names. Yes. You're very pretty, Melissa. Yes. I'm sorry if you're a Dogman Whisperer. Those of you that I missed saying her, I don't know if we need to identify that, but you are all awesome here in the hole. Yes. Uh, Jonathan D. Bertram. Yes. Ooh. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> These all conjured things you in our head. Just keep going. I'll give them six sound effects in a row. There you go. <laughs> yes. 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 Mm, awesome. Yes. Ashley H. Tansy. Ooh. Welcome like to be here. That fancy name. Fancy. Yes. Welcome in. Welcome to be here. Stacy Grace Brush Lucanon. Stacy Lucanon. All right. Stacey. How many knockers at the door? We missed you. Yes. Yes. I hope you're doing some good work down in the cave still. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, with those Tommy knockers. Still shining and mining. You're a hero. We appreciate you. David Hermanson. Welcome to be here, yes, sir. Son of Herman. Yes. Always welcome. Son of Herman. <laughs> Michael M. Townsend. You're. Welcome in, Michael. Welcome in. Okay, we're losing it. We're almost done here. We're running out of music. Uh, Kevin Hamilton, thank you so much Hamilton. for being in the hole. Yes. There's a... Founding father. Yes. Excellent. Welcome in. We love you. <laughs> Joseph Greatest. Yes. Greatest of all. Yes. And finally, Daniel Watson. All right. Thank you so much, yes. my dogman friend. Awesome. Another dogman here on the Our hole. Our beloved... And that's where we're going to wrap it up for today, guys. You guys are all awesome, amazing supporters that we couldn't do without you. We genuinely mean that. Yes. And for those of you who aren't members yet, thanks for sitting through no. that. I hope you had a good time. We don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> Sir John, Sir, this is the part of the show where John gets salty. <laughs> You're not a member yet. Just leave. No, we need to listen. 
get hooked in the hole. Get off the sidelines and get, get off the sidelines. Get off the sidelines and get in our hearts. Well, we'll see you guys in the expansion for some more paranormal parasite. I guess you can't call it fun, but uh, we'll make it fun. Yeah. Stick around for the outtakes. They're always there. Yes, they are. And uh, we'll see you guys in October when things start to get real spooky. So stay tuned. And we will see you next time on, on the Belief Hole. Damn it, I know. Hole. I don't know why every time it sounds like it needs All right, the. On, not a the. All right. On Belief Hole. Here comes Luomo Nero. Should I just keep going? Yeah. He must know that there's a child here who doesn't want to drink his soup. Terrible offense. Yeah, a terrible <laughs> accent, too. <laughs> it is also featured in a widespread nursery rhyme in Italy in the English version, John. What, what am I? Who am I? It's just a person. Lullaby. You, lullaby? you don't have to be an Italian man. <laughs> hey, lullaby Lola. Lullaby Lola. Oh, who do I give this child to? <laughs> <laughs> That's so bad. Can I reread mine? Sure. Did it badly. Here comes Luomo Nero. He must know that there's a child here who won't drink his soup. Do it again. You suck. <laughs> what should I do? What should I do? Just, Just like that. Lower. Don't be so smiley. Here comes Luomo Nero. You sound too excited. Yeah. Well, you're trying to scare your kids. Be like, here comes Luomo Nero. Oh, you want to horrify yeah. your kids? Yeah. Yes. All right. So he did the worst possible thing and stopped the truck to ask them. Jeremy, why don't you be the driver? John, you be the other guy. Okay, uh, so just say what, Jeremy? What? No, no, you're driving and they're, yell they're yelling at something from behind. Uh, I'm the driver. They're in my car? In the truck. They're somewhere. They can't hear you. Maybe they're in the bed of the truck. Oh, okay. They're just yelling something you don't can't make it out. What? <laughs> my cousins then became even more frantic as they yelled at him. Go, go! Wait, hold on. You can add some more goes in there too. Whatever feels natural. Go, go, go! Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. It sounded distorted. Oh, it was like you had an accident. <laughs> uh oh, uh -oh. John had an accident. <laughs> Some of that'll work. <laughs> There was no reply. Then I thought to myself, maybe it was my mom. So I yell, Mom! God, you're so bad. Mom! Hey, Mom! <laughs> hey, Mom, you coming? Where's pizza? Mr. Peterson! <laughs> Got the pizza dude coming! <laughs>